Amen. Good morning, St. Andrews. Welcome to worship. Not only that, but I hope you are having a fabulous memorial weekend uh, as we remember those service members who've given the ultimate sacrifice for us and our freedoms. There has been lots going on in the life of our church, and there will continue to be. Uh, one of those things, I really want to thank those that were able to come by last week to pick up your pictorial directories. It was a great and a heartwarming time just to see your smiles, even behind a mask and six feet away. Um, if you weren't able to do that, we are working on another time to be able to, to um, hand out and have folks come and pick up their pictorial directories. If you're not able to do that or if it makes you nervous, um, we also have it in a PDF form. And so we'd love to be able to give that to you as well. So feel free to reach out to me at the church. We call the church office. Another big thank you is for those of you that came out to help celebrate our seniors on Thursday night. It was so much fun to watch them as we had cars uh, lined up and got to cheer them on as they walked around the parking lot, really just getting to shower these uh, students, whether they're our seniors in high school or our eighth graders that were promoted, to get a chance to, for them to see um, our church in action, the love of this church for them in action. It was wonderful. The other thank you that I have is for you, the church. Um, for you, St. Andrews, thank you so much for all the grace that you've shared with us um, as staff and as leaders as we're trying to figure out uh, what the next steps look like. Our session has been meeting um, and discussing really prayerfully, uh, trying to figure out what, what does re-entry look like for St. Andrews. So you ought to have already um, received an email, if you haven't, it will be coming short soon, um, that has our very first preliminary steps. And um, so we invite you to take a look at that. Also with that is a, um, is a survey. One of the things about this survey is really for us, because we're not getting one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, communication and uh, being getting pulled behind after, after service, we'd really love to hear how you're feeling about all of that. So uh, feel free, when you get it, take a few minutes, fill that survey out. But also my hope is that you continue to pray. Pray for us as a church. Pray for our session and our leadership as they make decisions on how to responsibly um, do worship in the, in in few weeks in whatever it looks like, um, and so we just ask that as as those decisions are happening and making continue to pour out that grace, and we thank you so much for your prayer um, in our discernment process. One of the realities of all of this in in isolation in in th that this has been hard. This is ten weeks that we have been doing this, and which seems so far long ago. Um, and one of the things about it is that whether you are doing well now or, or maybe you're not, maybe it's still a big struggle. So often in, in church services, you'll see at the benediction, Pastor Jim and I will say this, these words and some of you know them, you will mimic our actions. But we say, you know, if you have prayer needs for anything, there are folks that would love to pray for you under the crosses or Stephen ministers around the corner in the prayer tower. So our hope is that if you need prayer, if you need someone to talk to, we'd love to get to pray for you. We'd love to find a Stephen minister for you um, and just really help each other through all of this. So if you um, want, you can go to our, our website and to our care page, and we can get you in contact with the Stephen ministers. Um, but also feel free to call the church office, and we'll um, and love to get a chance to pray for you. The reality is, as all of this is changing, and we have these different uh, opinions, different des desires, we all come here together. Not maybe physically, but through the Holy Spirit. And so as we begin worship, let us realize that we're not alone. Let us take a deep breath and trust in the Creator as we are led into worship. Oh. 
I love the Lord who heard my cry and pitied every groan. Long as I live and troubles rise, I'll hasten to Amen. Will you please join me for the call to worship? Let us come before the Lord with open hearts. Let us bring our broken dreams, our conflicts, and our griefs. For God is good, and out of sorrow will come new gladness. The Lord will fill us again with power to sing with joyful hearts. to God who reigns above the God of all creation the God of power the God of love the God of our salvation with healing balm my soul is filled and every faithless murmur stilled to God all praise and glory. What God's almighty power hath made God's gracious mercy Watchful I ne sleepeth within the kingdom of God's might. Lo, all is just and all is right to God all praise and glory. Amen. Would you join me this morning in our corporate prayer of confession? O God of heaven and earth, creator of all we have and are, we come before you today as those who need your help with faithfulness. We long to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, yet our service to you has fallen short. Oh, give us the strength of your Holy Spirit, 
that we might set our hearts more squarely on the goal of unwavering commitment to your lordship in all of life. Amen. Let us now enter into a time of silent confession. Lord, come by here. Someone's praying, Lord, come by here. Someone's praying, Lord, come by here. Oh, Friends, the good news of the gospel is this, is that our story does not end in sin, but because of God's grace and love, even though while we were still sinners, he sent his one and only son to let us know that we have hope in him. He's given us his love and grace and mercy so much so that we can be assured now and forever that we have been forgiven. the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Friends, as God in Christ has heard our confessions and forgiven us of our sins, let us each now offer that same peace and forgiveness to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. The scripture this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 5 through 14. Well then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by, do, by your doing the works of the law, or by your believing what you heard? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, uh, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. See, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit 
through faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. morning. Hi, most of you do know me. My name is Connie and I have the privilege of being on staff here at St. Andrews for three years now. And Pastor Jim asked us some questions this last week and so I'm going to answer them now. Uh, thank you ahead of time. So the first one is, if you could have a reset after this crazy quarantine season, what and how would you do live differently? Well, for me, as one who likes to make things happen, especially for the kingdom of God, is learning to slow down, still make things happen, but at a slower pace, learning to have quiet times. I love to go out in our yard now with our new gazebo and just sit there and look at the mountains. And that makes me feel the presence of the Lord in a new and more peaceful way. And I'm learning, again, that uh, planning, preparing, and pushing 
it's still going to be my modus operandi, but I'm no longer going to be like, like push, push, pushing. It'll be discernment and slowly planning. And the second question, what have you learned? I've learned that uh, Jesus still gives you peace. As he says in John, that it's his peace that he leaves with us. Not like any other peace that we could get in anything else. So I'm learning that. And I'm learning to connect uh, with my family in different ways. With Zoom, with texting, with distance, uh, seeing each other. And just more time just to be, just to be. And the third question is what habits or values will you make for the future? I will continue the habit of being quiet before the Lord, whether it's in our new gazebo or whether it's by the pool or whether it's in my sunroom, just spending time with the Lord in a quiet place and feeling his love and his care for me. Because that's one of the most important things is caring for ourselves and our soul. And the, those of us in ministry and even in life situations, we tend to forget that. And it's really important for us to do that. So the other big thing is to continue my number one value with family, to continue to connect with them, whether it's texting, Zooming, or seeing them in person, or writing letters. Uh, that's just number one in my heart. So thank you for letting me share. Great words from Pastor Connie, a.k.a. Reverend Spitfire. Um, today we are excited because we're starting a new sermon series, and it is titled, What Many of Us Are Thinking. And the title of our sermon series is, Where Do We Go From Here? God is a Giver of Gifts. Now, there is a phrase that is being said a lot right now in this season, and it's a phrase I used to like, but I think we're all getting tired of it, and that phrase is the new normal. Um, I have a proposal. What if God doesn't want us to necessarily go back to what was, but God is giving us an opportunity to do something new, to create a new beginning? a new chapter, a new possibility. I'm a firm believer that on the other side of uncertainty is opportunity. So each week we're going to have a testimony before the sermon of someone in our church family that's sharing where God is at work in their lives in this season and where God is doing a new beginning. And so that question really is a question for all of us. I want us to wrestle with in this season, what is the new way of living or purpose God is calling you to? What is your new beginning? And so to do this, we're going to be looking at some of the great heroes of the Old Testament. God gave many of those heroes new beginnings, and many of them didn't start off smooth. And so as we look at their journey, it helps us with our own journey. So we're going to look tonight at Abraham, next week Hagar, then Joseph, Moses, the Israelites, David, and then we're going to look at Ruth and Esther. So here's the theme for today. Often new beginnings involve course corrections. Let me say that again. Often new beginnings involve course corrections. The matriarch of nursing, Florence Nightingale, grew up in Victorian aristocracy, and she was destined, according to her parents, to marry rich. She refused a marriage proposal. Her mom and dad were not too happy about it, and then she enrolled into nursing. We have Alfred Nobel, the famous scientist who was the founder of the Nobel Peace Prize. He started off not even wanting to be a scientist. He wanted to be a poet and a student of literature. And then suddenly he found himself taking a chemistry class, and the rest is history, and he became an incredible scientific inventor. And then you have someone who was a poet, Edgar Allan Poe, the literary genius, who actually enrolled into West Point for a military career, and it didn't go too well. After he was expelled his first year, 
The devastating defeat started him on a course correction, and he became this incredible writer. Again, new beginnings involve course corrections. Now, God chose Abram and Sarah. They were a couple that were old in age. They were also a couple who probably had parents and grandparents who worshiped pagans. We don't know why God chose them, but God did. And he told Abraham, I'm going to give you a new beginning. Now, this isn't just a new beginning for Abraham. This was a new beginning for all of redemption. So God encountered Abraham, and Abraham looked at all the stars. He says, look at those stars. That is going to be your family, and your descendants will be a great nation. And then he tells Abraham, but I want you to move from your home in Ur and move to a new area called Haran. And we often skip that part, but think about that. He wanted him to move, and it's not like he had a moving company. He wanted to move his whole family, his flocks, everything that was his livelihood, and from his home to a land where he would be a foreigner. So basically, God was saying, I want you to move where your identity is to a new identity. And so this is called what we call the Abrahamic covenant. It was a binding agreement, and God's covenant is seen as rock-solid commitment. As the creator of the world approaches Abraham and says, I will make a covenant with your family, and they will be a great nation. Here's Genesis 12, 2 through 3. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God gave Abraham a promise of a new beginning, of offspring, Not just family, not just children, but a nation. But he also said that through your family, that this is going to be a gift to the world. He says that I will bless the whole world through you, shimmering like an oasis in the desert. God was going to bless the world once again with justice where God and his people would live in harmony, where God's chosen people would blend together to be the world, a voice of the living God. The nations would worship God through the witness of Israel. And as we see the story, Israel got sidetracked. Abraham has a covenant promise of blessing. He has a clear purpose. He's not just having children. He's not just going to have a great nation, but that nation was a purpose to be a blessing to the world. But we see Abraham take this covenant, take this blessing, hold it to his heart. But like all of us, he gets sidetracked. There's a famine. So Abraham and Sarah go to Egypt to live there for a while. Now I have a wild thought. It's conjecture. But what if the famine, this world crisis he found himself in, was actually God's way of bringing him to Egypt for his purpose? Maybe God was using the famine so he could mirror the power of God and actually bring Egypt into a worshiping relationship with God. Maybe this crisis was that Abraham was going to bring Egypt back and to God for the very first time. This idea that he would not only be a blessing to the nations, but imagine that if he blessed Egypt and if he lived out of his purpose, what if never the Israelites ever ended up in slavery? It's a wild, crazy thought, but sometimes we can get sidetracked in the midst of all that is around us, from the purposes God has for us. But we see out of fear, Abraham doesn't show the power of God. Rather, he tells the Egyptians that Sarah is his sister. 
because she's so beautiful, he's afraid that they will kill him. The Pharaoh finds out and says, you didn't tell me this. And so Pharaoh ends up having curses upon him, plagues. He gets upset at Abraham and Sarah and literally kicks them out of Egypt. You see, Abraham had a posture of survivalism and protectionism and not necessarily the light to the nations and trusting his God. So he got sidetracked in Egypt for some time. I think what happened to Abraham often happens to me and happens to all of us, and it definitely happened to me in this crisis, that I focus so much on the predicament that I don't see the possibility around the corner. We think that they would learn by this instance in Egypt, but instead later on in the story, they get sidetracked again. Sarah says it's taken an awful long time for God's promise to happen. Maybe you, Abraham, should actually have a child through Hagar to fulfill God's promise in a way that we design and they took matters in their own hand. And if we read the story, which we'll read next week, it didn't work out so well. Sometimes I ponder how many times out of fear or even comfort that I have been sidetracked from an opportunity to live in God's purpose and calling. How many times have I taken matters in my own hand? A question I believe all of us need to ask Am I living into my promise and purpose, or am I getting sidetracked? I think about how many times I've been hiking, and I catch myself, and I feel a little bit lost, and the proper thing to do is, rather than panic, I, I need to just take a deep breath and pause and look around, get my bearings, and find a course correction. If my kids are watching this today, they're going to turn to me and say, you don't do that. You panic and you run around in circles. But the Old Testament is filled with God giving Israel course corrections. All the heroes had course corrections. You and me, this is what is so personal about the story this week, is that we will get sidetracked. We are Abraham and Sarah. But God loves us so much that God personally will steer us back on course. The great imagery, again, of another metaphor of the great shepherd, that when we wander, the shepherd will come after his sheep. But we must pause and pray and allow God to lead us. I believe the season we find ourselves in, many of us would say we've gotten sidetracked. And some of us even say that this crisis has become a huge course correction. I was talking to a dad the other day, and I've had many other conversations like this where he said, gosh, being with my kids all this time, the last several months, I realized how much I made work a priority and not my family. When we move on, my new beginning is to make my family a priority. I think for me, I've had a course corrections because I know and I've preached this awful lot that I'm a doer and I get caught into busyness. And as I've slowed down over the last weeks, God keeps reminding me your new beginning is to pause and be with me and to worship me. I think many of you have stories and we're going to hear some of these stories of where God is saying, you have been here. And then we have this huge disruption that we're still in. And God is saying, on the other side, something different is going to happen. Trust me. What is your new beginning? That's the question we have to wrestle with. Who do you want to become in this next chapter of life? When I went to seminary the first week, I found an old friend that I hadn't seen in five years, and his name was Jeff. And he, when I knew him five years earlier, he was a surfer. He had kind of this rock vibe and rock and roll. And so when I saw him five years later, he introduced himself to my friends, and he had a haircut. He had professional clothes on, 
and he didn't call himself Jeff. He reached out his hand, says, hello, my name is Skip. And I looked at him and said, who is Skip? But he said, you know what? I moved all the way here. No one knows me from my past. I thought I'd have a new look, a new way of living, and why not a new name? He was being biblical because in the Old and New Testament, whenever God and Jesus gave someone a call, they gave him a new name. Jesus gave Simon what we studied several weeks ago, the title Peter, the rock, Petros, because he was giving him a new identity that was linked to his call. So God gives Abraham a new name or gives Abram a new name of Abraham, which means the father of many, because he was giving him a new identity that was linked to his purpose. I want to be clear here. When I talk about new beginnings, I'm not just talking about creating new goals. I'm not saying just get a yellow pad and say, you know what, like a New Year's resolution, Jim says to myself, this is what I often say, every New Year's I'm going to pray more and lose weight. This is more than goal setting. I'm talking about shifting our identity. It's huge. This takes a transforming of values, a change of habits, and a desire to even change our worldview. So when I ask you the question, what is your new beginning? I'm really asking you, who do you want to become? Who do you want to become after this crisis? Who does God want you to become in the middle of this crisis? So here's the first question of the day. Are you living into your promise and purpose? Or are you getting sidetracked? The second question of the day, what is the course correction you need to take in this season of life? What is your new beginning? I asked the question today, but let's be honest. It's going to take us all summer, all sermon series to know the answer. We are shifting right as we speak from crisis mode to what do we do next mode. And I am learning that I am better in crisis mode than what do we do next mode. The last couple weeks, I have struggled with this shift because I don't know what's next. And ultimately, I have to trust. I want us all to wrestle Where do our values, our habits, and our worldview need to shift? Who do you want to become on the other side of this crisis? God is a God of new beginnings. He's doing something in me. He's doing something in this church. He is doing something in you. We may not fully understand it. It may not all be clear. But God is a God of new beginnings. Lord, you love us. You chase after us. And Lord, we may not understand until years from now what you were up to this season. But you're up to something. And Lord, we just pray that we open our hearts, we open our eyes, and allow you to create what you're creating within us. We thank you and we praise you. Amen. Make me 
after thy will while i am waiting yielded and still have thine own way lord have thine own way search me and try me Master today, whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only. Amen. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day and every day that you grant us. As we take deep breaths in, help us remember that it is your breath in our lungs, your breath within us that gives us life. And so God, we give you great thanks and praise for all that you do for us. God, as we live our lives in the midst of pandemic, as we live our lives in the midst of chaos, help us focus on you. God, as you're recreating us, as you're making us new, as you're giving us a new name, a new identity, a new purpose, Help us not keep our eyes, not lose sight of who you are. God, help us be the people that this world needs. Help us be the people that you need for this world. Help us be people who are sowers of hope. As we look and we turn on the television, we see um, just fractions. God, help us be sowers of hope and love and grace and mercy. Help us be sowers of justice. Help us be more and more like you. As we sung in that hymn, God, help us as we live our lives that people every single day see more and more of Christ within us. God, as we look around this world and we see threats of war, we see even in this pandemic leaders jockeying for position, how do we know that even in this that there is going to be more that will come us out? More need? More places for your people to step in? So God, help us look out for those opportunities. Help us look for ways to be your light to this world, to be your hope and love to this world that needs it as much now as it will for it, until you come again. So God, this morning we give you great thanks and praise for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that we know and trust and hope that you will do. So God, hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to receive this morning's offering, as we, the music is played and sung over us, we always say this, that God wants our times, treasures, and talents. But the reality is, as we often say, is that God wants to start with our hearts. God wants to start that course correction with our hearts. So as music is played and sung over us, let us give back to God what belongs to him in the first place. Lord, you are the giver of life. You are the giver of all things. And so, Lord, we respond to you with our gifts, with our time, talents, and treasures for your kingdom purposes. We dedicate them here and now in your son's name. Amen.
Amen, amen. As many of you know, tomorrow is Memorial's Day. And I have to be honest with you, as we go through this crisis, time of uncertainty and unknown, for some reason it has made me think and ponder but make Memorial Day that much more important to me. Because for all those who fought for our freedom, they also fought uncertainty. They fought the unknown. And so let us remember today, let us remember tomorrow, all those who went before us. So let us all go out, knowing that we have a God who loves us, who holds us, who will never let us go. But let us open our eyes and our heart to who God wants us to become. Amen.